Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. This week on the show, out of the galleries and into the streets. This week on the program, I talk with one of the most recognized street artists in the world. Her name is Swoon. How we use our public space is fiercely contested. We can hold a ticket tape parade for a winning sports team or shut down a city for security, but meet, occupy, disrupt with art? That's not always so easy, as our next guest well knows. Caledonia Curry, also known as Swoon, is one of the most recognized street artists in the world. And she's brought her art from the streets to the galleries to projects like musical houses in New Orleans, a ceramic tile factory in Pennsylvania, a floating city on rafts, and a rebuilding community in Haiti. I'm very happy to have Swoon here with us on the show. Hi, Swoon. Welcome to the program. Hi. How are you? <laughs> Thank you. So, so street art, did you start in the street? Did you start in the galleries? Which? Well, I started in the street more or less, although I have a fine arts background. But very immediately upon moving to New York and beginning to study, I realized that I needed to make something which was more deeply involved in my life. And that was kind of my first answer. So when did that all begin and how? That began about 1999, uh, 2000. I was still in school at the time and I just had a sort of a breakdown around painting and around the kind of channels of fine arts and the role of art in mm -hmm. our lives in that way and so I just started to create projects that would function differently and the first one was a series of posters that happened outside on the street and it became like a kind of a total obsession from there. Mm. So what upset you about the sort of normal run-of-the-mill art business world. Yeah, well, I think that there's this feeling that what you're going to make is a square that's for investment that goes over a couch and that that's the whole of its life cycle. And for me, I was like, no, creativity is everything to me. I need to make something that is my life, that's part of my life, that intersects with the city, how we live our lives, how we perceive ourselves, how we occupy our spaces. You know, I wanted to kind of get creative in a way that would turn the wheel of how I understood my own life and mm -hmm. so it was it for me it's been a process of answering that question in about a thousand different ways so how does it go from I've seen you put up your work on the street mm -hmm. but then I've also seen you work with entire communities of people mm -hmm. um, how does that part happen is it just yeah. automatically people yeah. come up they want to take part <laughs> <laughs> well I think that um, as an artist I have a kind of a few different personalities. One of them needs a very much alone time and needs to be creating something in the studio, very detailed and intensive and a kind of a, a work of art. So that, the artist in the garret. You there, there you go. And then, but, but after a while I start going, oh my God, like there's this other part of me. I need to engage with people. I need to be around people. I need to be working together with people because I feel like that's kind of one of our deepest human needs is like working together on things. So then what happens to the artistic vision? Well, then there's the struggle. So you kind of bring that into community and all of a sudden it's like this whole other process and you have to really be willing to let go of a lot of things to understand that your ideas are definitely not always the best ideas mm -hmm. and to, to be fed by the ideas of others and be brave enough to share your mm. ideas, kind of all of these things. And then oftentimes after like a few months of that, I'm like, oh my God, I need to go back in the studio and <laughs> just do my own thing for a little while. You know, so it's, for me, it's a cycle. So tell us a little bit about the Haiti project, which sounds amazing. Mm -hmm. So the project in Haiti started five years ago, kind of in the immediate aftermath of the earthquake. And the moment that I had was that I had been working on the floating rafts that you talked about. Mm. And it was a thing that I had done with a huge group of people. And we kind of essentially had moved mountains in order to make this really ridiculous, wonderful thing happen. And the whole time I was like, this is amazing. But what would happen if we used this much creative resourcefulness and brought it to a, to a situation of crisis or need? Like, how would that you know, could we sort of do as unlikely th of things? And so I, artists as problem solvers. Basically, yeah, and as kind of human being communicators. And so I got together with a small group of friends right after the quake, and we said, okay, let's put our minds to this problem. And we connected with a small village uh, who were farmers who were kind of organizing themselves um, in, the, in an organization called the Mango Growers Association. Mm -hmm. And they were just outside the epicenter of the quake, and they were kind of a little bit out of the, the pathway of a lot of aid. And so we connected with them directly. And I kind of soon found that there was a real magic in being a small group of human beings connecting directly with another mm. small group of human beings and just saying like, hey, 
let's work together and kind of reaching for resources from my own creative community in New York and bringing them to this situation of rebuilding after the earthquake. And so the first project that we did was actually um, beginning with a community center. Um, and then we did some rebuilding uh, two homes. And now we're working with the farmers who want to start a bamboo project mm -hmm. around trying to see how that kind of fits in architecturally and also doing some kind of after school programming and different things because I started a bit naively and quickly realized that what we were building was a very long-term relationship mm. with the place. The thing that we heard a lot after the earthquake was that earthquakes of this magnitude had happened um, in a lot of other places but weren't nearly as devastating. Um, and what we saw when we got here was that that was basically a result of the economic situation, that everything is imported, all the building materials are really expensive, people can't afford to use enough of the right material, and so you have all of these, you know, cinder block building after cinder block building that's just Pancaked. Our solution to the problem that we really saw there was to um, go with an earth bag style of building. The actual shape of it is very strong and it uses less material per square footage than say a square house would. The structural integrity, uh, just the shape of a dome and the shape of a circle, both have the property of distributing any exterior force throughout the whole shape rather than with a square or rectangular building which only takes the force at one point. What I think really meant a lot to people was that we came back because people were like, oh, you didn't just show up, do one thing, not even finish it and then leave. Oui, moi c'est que bien que nous pas contre toutes mais nous ca you know mon qui ca aider mon construire, montrer l'autre mon construire forme type de caisse ça parce que nous fait un peu l'expérience là. The greatest thing about earth bag building is, with some healthy hard work, you can build your own house rather than paying someone else to build your house for you. A third of our budget goes directly to employing local laborers and cooks and skilled masons and craftspeople. The creation of jobs was really, really every bit as important as the creation of the structure. So we've learned a lot in the first two buildings and now we are trying to create something which, you know, we've had a, a few community meetings, we've asked like what's working, what's not working about these structures, um, and we want to create something that continues to evolve in a way that's like in direct kind of reciprocity with what we're receiving as feedback. Okay. Informatique, okay. mécanique, okay. plomberie. Tout le monde, 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 tout le tout le monde, tout tout le monde, 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 tout le so what would be your advice to people who are working for all those nonprofits that got mm -hmm. so criticized mm. by for collecting so much money and mm. using so much of it themselves? Right. I mean, I don't believe that I really have a kind of a, a huge structural answer because some of the problems really are huge structural sure. problems. But in my own experience, the kind of small human scale was very effective. And so I would just say to not forget that, to not underestimate what one group of people can do when they reach out directly to another group of people. So that gets to the question of the value of art in a, in a way. I know mm -hmm. you're doing more than art in Haiti. but. Yeah. In the introduction, I talked about how contested public space is mm, mm -hmm. and how difficult it is to get partly legislative mm -hmm. and police department buy-in mm. to disruptions that aren't for sports or winning a war or yeah. uh, I don't know what else. Mm -hmm. um, what case do you make to, to funders, to communities to say, you know what, let's do this today. Mm -hmm. Let's put up this piece of street art. Let's work together on this piece of art. Um, mm -hmm. You can't eat it necessarily. Mm -hmm. It's not going to feed people. Mm -hmm. It's going to do something else. Mm -hmm. What do you say? Well, I, I guess I have quite a few different answers yeah, to that, but the first, one that, <laughs> the first one that pops to my mind just has to do with people's sense of like what happens when people get to be a hands-on part of creating their community. That I think that so many of us are born into systems that are already in place. And so there's a kind of a sense of alienation from those systems and from the physical world. And so I think that when we are creatively able to set our hands on something um, and able to be a part of the kind of the small and creative decisions of making our place, we feel at home, we care about our home more, we feel that it represents us and that it 
that we are able to kind of just feel more invested in and take care of it in a different way. Um, and so I just think that like giving people creative outlet to be a part of having a say in what their city looks like is just part of a healthy community mm. in my opinion. And, and how does it intersect with the discussion around gentrification? Because mm -hmm. everything I'm hearing you say is mm -hmm. about bringing people out mm -hmm. to express their creativity. Mm -hmm. But you're still going in, and mm -hmm. in some places, mm -hmm. the artist arriving is a yeah. alarm bell that the that the neighbors about to, neighbor is about to price them out. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting because when I very first started working on the street, the discussion around public space was completely different oh, than so. it is now because it was. I think that I was, it was in that kind of post-September 11th era where the sort of, we were, it was, everyone was thinking about the kind of corporate takeover of public spaces and there wasn't yet as much of an alarm that like the artist coming into a space and kind of being creative is an alarm bell, which it is now and I absolutely see that. And so that's just been really interesting for me to kind of watch and be a part of and I would say that some of the ways that I think about it are going from the temporary action to the long-term action. So when I started We Pasting on the Street, I was like, put up a poster, leave, right? And then the project, for example, that I have working on in Braddock is you have a group of artists who are sort of working on... Is this the ceramic tile factory? The ceramic tile factory, exactly. So we're working on a church and working to save this church from demolition. But in doing so, we're working on creating jobs for people locally to be a part of the recreation of this space. Mm. So the kind of direct answer to gentrification of being like this isn't about the actions aren't about pushing people out the actions are about actually providing more opportunity and really digging in deeply to like who is here what opportunities are needed how can we answer those needs and how can we do it creatively what kind of skills are people coming away with? um in this instance it'll be about tile making so it'll be about the ceramic tile making kind of of all different kinds from the very simple you know, just like press molds to sort of silk screening and designing and the kind of more artisanal. There's some video of the Braddock project. Mm -hmm. um, let's take a look. Hi, welcome to North Braddock. I'm here with the Heliotrope Foundation and we are opening an art space community center and we want you to learn more about the Braddock Tiles project and hopefully to be a part of it. The Braddock Tiles project started many years ago when we were introduced to this building. I remember the moment of kind of just like